There's news today of a major hack of government computers. The risk of being compromised online seems to be lurking around every corner. We learned yesterday that thieves stole personal data from more than 100,000 taxpayers through the IRS website. And with the Sony attack, we see security breaches can bring big companies to a screeching, embarrassing halt. Technology has forever changed the world we live in. All of you know this every single day. We're online in one way or another all day long. As consumers, we do more online than ever before. We manage our bank accounts. We shop. We pay our bills. We handle our medical records. Having uh, an internet-enabled home, internet-enabled car, uh, sensors all over your body to keep track of your vital signs and health, or maybe smart cities uh, that are keeping track of use of resources, traffic flow and things like that, could make our lives a lot easier. But at the same time, there's always a risk of using powerful technology that has the possibility of being subverted to do something we didn't want it to do. The power of the internet is that you can basically connect to it, have a new invention and deploy it without asking permission to anybody else who operates that internet. As a country, one of our greatest resources are the young people who are here today. Digitally fearless and unencumbered by convention and uninterested in old debates and they're remaking the world every day. But it also means that uh, this problem of how we secure this digital world is only going to increase. We have to make sure that it's an environment that people feel comfortable in, in the way that they feel comfortable in the physical world. Hackers linked to China may have accessed sensitive background information of intelligence and military personnel. Target says 40 million credit and debit card accounts. Health insurance company be Anthem be says it is scrambling to notify millions of its customers. The federal government says some 4 million current and former federal employees may have had their personal information hacked. Who is responsible for this? The Internet is made up of a vast quantity of software running in a vast quantity of different platforms. Software, I'm sorry to say, uh, is not perfect. In fact, we've never learned how to make software that has no bugs. And because software has bugs in it, mistakes, uh, some people have figured out how to exploit the existence of those vulnerabilities to penetrate the software, to put in Trojan horses or you know, other kinds of malware. A lot of the problems we have with computer security is making it work in the face of attack. And there are lots of different attackers out there. We're worried about hackers and criminal attackers. We're worried about governments, maybe our own government, maybe foreign governments. We're worried about politically motivated hacking. We're worried about our kid sister or our spouse or our friends. And lots of things we're worried about in security. And the hard part we're learning is making our systems secure against those various adversaries. People are easily fooled. Security is a hard thing. It's a social thing. People by themselves are trusting, trust, trusting, trusting primates, so to say. We, we trust people. Without trust, there's no economy. Economies work on trust. Societies work on trust. People work on trust. Without trust, you can't have anything you see around you. You're, we're just a, a, a species of savages. We depend on the fact that we trust who we're interacting with. I depend on the fact that when I think I'm moving my life savings around, I'm actually interacting with my bank and not somebody who's collecting all my information and is going to go to my bank later. I have to be able to, to trust who I work with. If you don't trust your bank online, you're not going to use online banking. Banks are not going to transfer money. Medical industry, we're not going to be sharing in electronic health records. We're not going to call our doctor. And making trust work in cities, in technology, on the internet is critical to making the internet work. So as humans, we have you know, thousands of years of understanding about what it means to be secure and what trade-offs we want to make between security and convenience. And we all know what a neighborhood is or where you're going to walk or if you're going to be home or how many locks you want on your door and just how much inconvenience really makes sense. But online, it's so new, we don't know that. We have our own responsibilities as consumers of the Internet services to protect ourselves and others. We know, for example, that it is a bad idea to use a password called password and yet, that is the most common password on the internet.
You're not supposed to be able to get outside our network. You shouldn't have made your password password. What was the name of the street I grew up on? Password Drive. If you choose bad passwords that other people can penetrate, two bad things can happen at least. One of them is that your own accounts could be infiltrated. Maybe your bank account could be uh, uh, emptied. But worse, if there is something that you have access to that you're responsible for, and the key to that is your username and password, and someone else manages to break into that, they can do the things that you would do because they become you. Finding out that someone in the Russian mafia has all your credit card information and your social security number doesn't make the average voter happy. What government can do about data breaches is increase the penalties. And right now, your data is not very well protected because the cost of losing it isn't very high to the companies that have it. What we know is that the market by itself is not providing a high level of security in a uniform way. If I want to release a, a new operating system or a new application, uh, I want it to be as secure as possible. I'm going to have to put a lot more people on development. I'm going to have to slow down release. Um, there's a huge incentive to get my software on the market as fast as possible. You know, this is a, a world where the fast doesn't often win, and uh, I may be willing to compromise security, especially if my users don't really know the difference. There are much more secure technologies uh, that create single-use uh, authorization mechanisms, but the reality is those are more expensive uh, for the merchants and the vendors and they require more effort uh, um, uh, by the individuals who use them. One thing that we would like to feel uh, is that the information that we inject into the net and we get back from the net has a certain amount of confidentiality to it when we care about that. The only mechanism we have available for achieving confidentiality in transit is in fact to use cryptography. At the moment that you connect to your bank or do web traffic uh, to a shop, you know you see that green little lock on the top of your address bar, that means you're using encryption. That means that any intermediary, your traffic passes through the internet to many intermediaries, but any intermediary on that path cannot look into your transaction. They cannot sniff your credit card numbers, they cannot look at the price you paid for the product, um, and that's important. Encryption is based on mathematical formulas that once you, you know, apply them, are very, very hard to find solutions for unless you have certain parameters. We've got symmetric encryption, which is we basically mathematically scramble clear text uh, into what we call crypt text, uh, such that an attacker can't figure out what the clear text was. And we basically will come up with this mathematical transformation uh, and then put in a key. So take the clear text and the key, out comes the scrambled information. We have asymmetric encryption as a way to kind of address that, where we have a public key and a private key based on a mathematical concept of uh, one-way functions. And the uh, canonical example is multiplication. Uh, if I take two primes, multiply, you know, use them to multiply, if I know both primes, I can divide and come up with you know, what the answer is. But if you don't know what those two numbers are, you have to do factoring. Multiplication, pretty easy in math terms, order n squared kind of operation. Uh, factoring, very, very hard. Uh, takes a lot longer to do that. So it's almost as if you had a door with two key slots, one key slot for locking the door and a different key slot and a different key for unlocking the door. So this is two-factor uh, cryptography or public key cryptography. Technology has become a tool of choice for some very dangerous people. And unfortunately, the law has not kept pace with technology, and this disconnect has created the significant public safety problem we have long described as going dark. As we try to make sure uh, that the infrastructure we have is secure, uh, that if I want to send a message to you or have a phone conversation with you or uh, uh, share pictures with you that there's no one in the middle scooping up that data for other purposes. Barack Obama received an open letter from Google, Apple, Facebook, and other tech giants urging him not to provide law enforcement with access to encrypted smartphone data. Maybe that person in the middle is a uh, cyber criminal who wants to try to get my credit cards. Maybe that person in the middle 
uh, is a terrorist who wants to try to take advantage of me and blackmail me. Maybe that person in the middle is a law enforcement agency who thinks either you uh, or I have done something wrong and, and are suspected of a crime. Uh, the real challenge in the debate about encryption in law enforcement is that we can't tell the difference between those three actors uh, uh, for, the, for the purpose of securing the network. Either the communication between you and me is secure or it isn't. Just so we're clear, you're saying it's your position that in encryption programs there should be a backdoor to allow, within a legal framework, the ability to go in a backdoor. So backdoor is not the, the context I would use because mm -hmm. when, I, when I hear the word phrase backdoor, I think, well, this is kind of shady. Why wouldn't you want to go in the front door? Anytime law enforcement demands a backdoor to encryption, they are weakening it. They are weakening it for everybody. Strong encryption can't be broken. That's its point. If you put in a backdoor for the government, you invite criminals to use the same backdoor. I technically don't know how to build backdoors that can check the morality of the person who's using them. So the FBI Director James Comey, uh, the UK Prime Minister David Cameron, have to get used to the fact that strong encryption means it's gonna be strong against them. Law enforcement has thousands of tools at their disposal to solve crimes from fingerprint technology, to interviewing witnesses, to lots of forensic technologies. There's no problem here. It's not like all of these crimes are going unsolved. There's no murder spree in our world because of encryption. This is a giant red herring. We've kind of traded insecurity with a loss of privacy because the criminal element or other state actors can have access to that back door. They will have access to that back door. Uh, so we don't have security and we don't have privacy. The capabilities of being able to look into, your, into the traffic are highly democratized and they will get cheaper by the day. Um, so the state actor of today is the student of tomorrow, is the script kitty of the day after tomorrow, is the way that I usually think of this. Today's secret NSA programs become tomorrow's PhD theses and the next day hackers tools. There's a phrase in the intelligence community called the equities issue. Basically, when you see a vulnerability in something, there are two things you can do. You can fix the vulnerability, thereby protecting everyone, or you can exploit the vulnerability, thereby using it to gain intelligence. Now the problem is, if everybody's using the same stuff, right, if we're all using Cisco routers and Microsoft Windows and TCP IP, then that question becomes difficult. Right? Should the NSA fix a vulnerability, thereby protecting all of us, but also protecting the bad guys, or should they exploit the vulnerability, thereby eavesdropping on the bad guys, and also leaving us vulnerable? And so an example is Stingray. Stingray is an FBI tool that's basically a fake cell phone tower. Because your cell phone thinks it's talking to a real tower, it may give lots of information, including its current location. Uh, in some cases, it will actually uh, send information unencrypted, that is your phone call. And the device may if it's, be able to intercept an unencrypted stream and listen in. So the FBI uses this a lot. The NSA does too, I'm sure. But we found last year that there are in Washington, D.C., around the country, these fake cell phone towers run by we don't know who. The Stingray works because it's exploiting a vulnerability in the cellular system. So if it still exists today, it has to exist because nobody wanted to fix it. Whether law enforcement needs a full court order to use this technology is, of course, an important question, but it really should be a secondary question. There's an even more important question that we are not talking about. And that is, why is this vulnerability there in the first place? Here's the equities issue. If we fix this, and we should, the FBI loses Stingray. If we keep it vulnerable, we are all vulnerable to anybody else who wants to do the same thing. Edward Snowden uh, captured, or, or, captured or, or collected an enormous quantity of information 
related to the operations of the National Security Agency and its other uh, sister agencies uh, around the world. Uh, his release of that software ignited a conversation which is vital for especially democratic societies to have, which is how much do we want our national security apparatus to know about our personal lives in the effort to protect us from harm. So this January, Kaspersky Labs issued a report against something they called the Equation Group. It's actually the NSA. And what they found is an extremely sophisticated malware operation uh, targeted against many groups, many countries. And this is a window into the NSA's capabilities. There are tricks where the NSA can implant code in your computer's hard drive boot sector. So if you take the computer, erase the hard drive, erase the operating system, reinstall it, the malware is still there. This is amazing stuff. And of course it's not just the NSA. Kaspersky Group discovered this NSA operation, but these same tricks are going to be used by China and Russia. There has been a tension between absolute privacy and absolute safety and security, and somewhere we need to figure out where the balance is. If we want everybody to have better cybersecurity, that by nature makes it harder for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to conduct surveillance. You know, right now we're living in a society of pervasive surveillance. Everything we do involves computers, and computers naturally produce data about what they're doing. I mean, think about your cell phone. It's an incredibly invasive surveillance device. It knows where you are all the time. It knows when you wake up, it knows when you go to sleep. Everyone has a cell phone, so it knows who you sleep with. It knows who you're talking to, what you're saying. And, and this isn't a device we think of as a surveillance device. Right? We think of it as a telephone. And a lot of that surveillance is necessary to make the phone work. The phone has to know where you are, otherwise it can't ring. My Google Maps can't give you directions unless it knows where you are. It has to know what you're saying, who you're talking to, or the phone calls don't work. Big data privacy challenge is that we want to be able to learn things from increasingly large sets of data. People may be perfectly comfortable, for example, uh, that there's analysis of their browsing habits for the purpose of deciding what kind of ad to show you. But that doesn't mean I want them to use it for any other purpose to develop an elaborate profile of me. That type of thing is true for all of our computers. The computers at our desk, the computers we interact with as we go about our day, they are all producing surveillance data. Uh, when you go on the web or you use apps on your smartphone, there's actually a lot of parties in there you don't know about. When you load the page in your computer, it tells hidden parties uh, the address of the page you're looking at. There's a fair amount of tracking going on by data brokers. So these are companies like Experion and Axiom. And their core business model is not advertising per se, but selling information about you to whoever wants to buy it. If you analyze my browsing habits in order to decide whether to offer me a job or in order to decide how much to charge me for my health insurance, that's a real intrusion. That really harms me as an individual and that's unfair to me as an individual. There's been some kind of chilling cases. There's companies selling lists of people who had been raped or uh, you know, people who had AIDS. By the way, among the sites that pass data to third parties are cdc.gov and the commercial site WebMD. The kind of simplistic divide that sometimes people draw in the privacy debate is, are you opt-in or are you opt-out? That is, do you have to get permission for doing every single thing uh, you want to do with personal data, or is it up to the consumer uh, to object if they think something bad is happening? Well, surveillance is the business model of the internet. Most of the companies that you interact with on the net are making money by spying on you. I mean, this is Facebook, this is Google. This is why all the things on the internet are free. They're not really free. You're paying with your data, you're paying with your privacy. I mean, you don't see the 20, 30, 50 companies that are following you around the internet, watching what you're doing. Many of the privacy intrusions that we're concerned about today involve the misuse of personal data by people who actually have the legitimate right 
to access that data. In my lab at MIT, we've been working on building what we call accountable systems. This is ways to follow the flow and the use of information in any given database and assess whether the way that that data is ultimately used is consistent or not with whatever the rules are about how that data is supposed to be used. We've proposed that accountable systems are a key part of privacy protection going forward. One of the things that scares me the most about pervasive surveillance is how it leads naturally to social control. That if when people are under surveillance, they tend to conform. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anybody. You've got to think for yourself. You're all individuals. Yes, we're all. We are less individual when we know we're being watched, when we know we're being recorded, when we know what we say and do now could be judged five, ten years from now. My biggest fear about surveillance is that we all become less free by it happens. you all got to work it out for yourself. Yes, we've got to work it out. Society moves forward because people on the fringes break the rules. And if we lose that, we lose a lot. We have a tradition of what it means to build security, national and personal security, and to respect a degree of human rights. And what we see when the internet is involved is that the power of the internet often seems to override all of that. And our discussion of security comes in a different context and with different balancing. And we're not as explicit about looking at the heritage we have about what's the balance between the two. We want to make sure that people who use the internet have the most secure possible environment. We are balancing conflicting objectives. We're all part of one global uh, uh, internet environment and that we need to figure out how to uh, both protect privacy and enable the free flow of information in that environment.